Well, <laughs> welcome everyone to this event co-sponsored by the Department of English and the Primary Text Program. We are, I'm delighted today um, to introduce Dr. Sheila Kavanaugh from Emory University. She's a professor of English. Um, she has a PhD from Brown University and uh, also a master's from the University of New Hampshire. And she's also working on another master's in uh, public history. So she really likes learning a lot. Um, she, she's also, also the author of Wanton Eyes and Chaste Desires, Female Sexuality and the Fairy Queen, and Cherished Torment, The Emotional Geography of Lady Mary Roth's Eurasia. She has many other articles, both in pedagogy and Renaissance literature, um, and she, um, I think, really captures how to make primary texts like Shakespeare and the humanities in general more meaningful. Uh, her talk today is entitled, What Say You to a Neat's Foot? Shakespearean Manipulations of Food Practices Among the Elite in Early Modern England. Um, I often, when I think about food in the Renaissance, I often think I just could not live in Shakespeare's time because they did not have my two favorite foods readily available, coffee and chocolate. <laughs> so I'm not sure today if I'm gonna leave feeling hungry or less hungry, but we will just have to wait and see. Thank you. Thank you. Please help me Thank you very much, and it's been a lovely time in Kansas so far, so thank you very much. I'll start, the one image I was going to use, and I didn't bring it because I didn't want to put people to the trouble for one image, but I was going to bring you a picture of a neat's foot. Is there anyone here who has ever eaten a neat's foot? Okay, a neat's foot is a cow foot. And it, you can, neat's foot jelly is what mothers would give to their children when they were not feeling well. And you can, and so I, I know some people who are, say, in their early 60s who swear that their mothers gave them neat's foot jelly. And um, with the World Shakespeare Project, I uh, do some work in Casablanca. And if you go to the butcher's market there, they have neat's feet hanging in the window. But if you can imagine a cow foot. <laughs> when Grumio tempts the starving Katharina with food in the Taming of the Shrew, the dishes he suggests and the reasons he dispenses for denying her food correlate with many of the culinary, medicinal, and societal practices described in recent scholarship about food and hospitality in early modern England. The conversation between this pair invites close attention from those interested in food during this period. And so I'm going to quote it at length. I know some of you could probably recite it with me and some of you not. <laughs> Katharina says, what? Did he marry me to famish me? Beggars that come to my father's door upon entreaty have a present alms. If not elsewhere, they meet with charity. Grumio says, what say you to a neat's foot? Katharina, tis passing good, I prithee, let me have it. Grumio, I fear it is too choleric a meat. How say you to a fat tripe, finely broiled? Katharina, I like it well, good Grumio, fetch it me. Grumio, I cannot tell, I fear tis choleric. What say you to a piece of beef and mustard? Katharina, a dish that I do love to feed upon. Grumio, ay, but the mustard is too hot a little. Katharina, why then the beef, and let the mustard rest? Grumio, nay, then I will not. You shall have the mustard, or else you get no beef of Grumio. <laughs> Katharina, then both, or one, or anything thou wilt. Grumio, well then the mustard without the beef. No. Kath yeah, and Katharina says, go get thee gone, thou false deluding slave. Thou feedest me with the very name of meat. So the only thing she's going to get is the name of meat. During the time that Shakespeare was writing, England experienced considerable social changes and a lot of increasing international trade that included the importation of many previously unusual foods and spices. Not surprisingly, the innovations that were accompanying this period of rapid transition influenced numerable customs involving food preparation, dissemination, and hospitality. The speech that I just read, which is very topically dense between the starving Katharina and the obedient, at least Petruchio, but maliciously pray, playful Grumio, illustrates some of the apt culinary subjects introduced by today's prominent 
food historians who focus on England. Even though Taming of the Shrew is set in Italy, it seems likely that he drew a lot of his knowledge of food from his native country, since that's where, as far as we know, he did all of his eating. Um, Paul S. Lloyd has a wonderful book uh, from 2015 that talks about the many aspects of food culture in this period. He talks about the differences in diets among the people of varying social classes, of access to food, and ways that societal influences overshadowed nutritional needs when food was obtained, prepared, and eaten. Sometimes, for, to my eye, he seems to be questionably optimistic about the ability of poor people to get sufficient food. But he discusses the kind of charitable handouts that Kate references when she maintains that her father's household would respond to beggars more appropriately than Grumio treats her. Leslie Parker, who is a former cooking instructor at the Weald and Downland Living Museum, which is in the south of England near Chichester, I took a long series of Elizabethan cooking classes there, which, believe it or not, Atlanta, Georgia has very few Elizabethan <laughs> cooking classes. There are quite a lot in, um, in the south of England, and if you ever have the opportunity, I strongly recommend them. But when we were, ta when we were taking the classes, we were talking about the food exchanges between the wealthy and the people in need. And one of the things, when you're baking for an Elizabethan audience, you have to create your own pots and pans. You don't just go to the cupboard and get them. And so one of the things you do and is you make what's called a coffin. <laughs> and you use very low grade grains and water and you build the baking dish. And those coffins, after they were cooked, they weren't, they were very low grade, but they would either be given to animals or they'd be given to beggars who'd come to the door. And so that would be, so when Kate says um, that even beggars would be treated better, that's one of the things that they would get. I was saying this to somebody earlier today, and this is uh, hopefully the only tangent, but I think it's so fascinating. I didn't know this, you all may know more about this with Tudor cooking. But they would have an oven, and they, it, for, they'd have a wooden door, and you put the wooden door, you soak it in water, you then light sticks in the stove, in the oven. When they get hot, you sweep them out. You then take the door out of the water. You wrap it with bread dough. You put it in. The, the heat absorbs the water and it creates a seal. And you know that things are done when the bread dough is cooked. So next time you're trying to experiment with cooking. <laughs> um, Catherine's conversation with Grumio also reflects some of the foods becoming more popular among people in her station in life as well as the belief systems contributing to people's decisions about what to eat and how to prepare them health healthfully. Neat, neat's foot and tripe, some of you may know tripe, it's you know, a, a cow's stomach for instance, fit into the modern category of what we would call awful or organ meats. <laughs> and it's a food that many cultures find very delectable. My students think it's disgusting. According to Lloyd, awful was, consumption of awful was shifting during the period around Taming of the Shrew, from being eaten by poorer people into becoming something that, in, that was enticing their social betters. And this is a quote from him. Awful, by contrast, a hitherto low-status food was becoming increasingly popular with the upper orders of English society. He demonstrates this growing appeal through, quote, fashionable cookery books, from the popularity of awful at festival times, from the small quantities purchased and used sparingly, and from the market prices paid for it. He suggests that meat's tongue appears to have been bought more frequently than other kinds of offal. So if you haven't planned your dinner yet, meat's <laughs> tongue. And the records he cites suggest that meat's foot recipes were not prepared for common consumption. And here's a quote. An account book relating to the Earl of Northumberland's household consumption at Bath in 1591 shows that one pair of calves' feet 
was consumed at the supper table each evening by Sir Henry Percy, 23 traveling staff, and between seven to 10 high-ranking guests. Like the four needs feet supplied to Percy in the Tower of London in 1607, the small quantity of meat or jelly yielded by this feat was either exclusive to a few or it was eaten sparingly as part of a dish by several people. You can imagine if you've got 23 traveling staff, seven to 10 guests, and you're all sharing one pair of feet. Joan Thurks indicates that any English taste for offal was fleeting, suggesting by the late 17th century, and this is quote, a deprecatory attitude towards offal and other small pieces of beef carcass has crept in. Imagine that. <laughs> but Terry Breverton includes a 16th century recipe for pies of calves feet that indicates that the dish would be considered succulent. So this is where you want to start taking notes. <laughs> Take calves feet and wash them. Boil and blanch the hair of them. Season them with cloves and mace and a little pepper, verges and sugar, dates, prunes, corants, and sweet butter. You got that so far? Mm -hmm. Then make your paste of fine flour with yolks of eggs and raise the coffin square. When it is half baked, then take it out and put in verges and sugar with the yolks of hard eggs strained. Catherine's desperation for food earlier suggests that she happily consumed anything placed before her. But by calling the dish passing good, she implies that offal is both familiar and tasty. Grumio does not only appeal to taste, however, as he taunts her with the prospect of various meats. He refuses several dishes because he deems them too choleric for her temperament, suggesting that she should not be given meals that would increase her already excessive volatility. As Joan Fitzpatrick notes, choleric people were perceived to have a nasty disposition. They dream of fighting, quarreling, fire, and burning. Notably, however, Fitzpatrick also indicates that people of such temperaments should avoid fasting. So it's actually not a good thing that Catherine is left to starve. She further comments that early moderns believed the consumption of specific food and drink was capable of modifying one's type, something that Grumio implies when denying Catherine the meat she craves, with or without the mustard. In contrast, Lloyd indicates that beef and pork could be characterized by coldness and wetness in the humoral sense of the word, and that the proffered mustard was more likely to incite Catherine's temper since, quote, the heat and dryness of spices produced an excess of yellow bile in the body, thereby exacerbating the former's fiery temperament. Presumably, however, Grumio's humoral arguments didn't really have to be consistent. He wasn't going to feed her no matter what. So he was just coming up with a lot of reasons, but it fits with the theories that people had at the time. His failure to feed her primarily fuels the comic elements of the scene, but it also confirms many early modern ideas about food that circulated during Shakespeare's time. Lloyd divides his book into sections that talks about the different diets available to what the meaner sort, the middling sort, and the gentry. So people at different social statuses were expected and had ac at access to different food. Food fulfilled diffuse societal functions and carried many physical and emotional characteristics that could be transferred to the people that ate them. Kate's being starved because Grumio is following orders, but he's also using a lot of familiar excuses. Many texts about the role that food among, played among people of varied social status further imply that her increasing anger may be inflamed by the shame that's generated when she's dragged away from her wedding feast even after Petruchio acknowledges the expense, the planning, and the labor that's gone into the event. Petruchio says, I know that you think to dine with me today and have prepared great store of wedding cheer. 
He, however, he cons insists that Kate and Petruchio leave immediately, but he further acknowledges how, ex how extraordinary the event's going to be. He says that you that attend on the bride, go to the feast, revel and domineer, carouse full measure to her maidenhead, be mad and merry. Kate's bridal dinner would fulfill many societal expectations associated with her family standing in the community. Peter Breers talks at length about the importance of banquets in such environments. When he's talking about royal Tudor feasts, for example, he notes there were a number of reasons for the introduction of such banquets. Feasts were highly formalized displays of ceremony and power, every detail faultlessly performed by trained gentlemen to impress all observers. Although Kate's family are not royalty, the status they command in shrew suggests that their weddings, funerals, christenings, etc., would fulfill the role that Breers associates with such occasions, and I quote, Hospitality, especially in the plentiful provision of food and drink, was seen as an important Christian and social responsibility in early modern England. It brought praise and esteem to its providers, giving them a unique opportunity for displaying their wealth and power, while encouraging feelings of gratitude and loyalty in its recipients. Although Kate has to wait for her opportunity to participate in such a celebratory, luxurious repast, Lucentio suggests that the play's concluding feast that she does um, enjoy fulfills a similar function as her aborted marriage banquet, and this is Lucentio. Feast with the best and welcome to my house. My banquet is to close our stomachs up after our great good cheer. Pray you, sit down, for now we sit to chat as well as eat. As Beers indicates, the kind of meals offered in these households for these occasions served many ceremonial as many as purposes. Quote, no event gave a greater demonstration of hospitality than a feast. It might also be called a banquet. They varied considerably in their scale and quality, some being arranged to celebrate christenings and weddings for special times of year, and others for matters of state and international diplomacy. Allison Sim concurs with Breer's assessment of the role of feasts and banquets, noting, the ideal banquet was therefore very much an expression of all that was considered elegant in the 16th century. For those in attendance, these feasts would be the highlight of their social calendar. Catherine's failure to attend her own festivities, therefore, would have been particularly galling and embarrassing for her. But her attempt, her thwarted effort to enjoy a banquet created in her honor is not an isolated event in Shakespeare's drama. There are several significant feasts in the play that are either interrupted or corrupted. In the culinary context created by these food historians, the failure of these occasions to provide the entertainment, the luxuriousness, and the bounty associated with banquets during this period makes these events particularly striking. It would be easy, however, for modern audiences to miss the serious implications associated with disastrous feats. Although we do have the, what we call the bridezilla complex, so perhaps those kinds of wedding feasts. But in general, a disastrous dinner party isn't the end of your life, usually. While no one could fail to notice that these events cause considerable consternation on the part of the guests, the deep significance carried by such occasions in this time period increases the emotional weight of these already disturbing or horrifying scenes. Macbeth's royal banquet, for example, is marred when the ghost of the murdered Banquo either symbolically or actually fills the only remaining seat at the table. He, Macbeth shows up, doesn't see any chairs, and responds with terror, the table's full. Lennox says, here's a place reserved, sir. Macbeth says, where? And Lennox said, here, my good lord. What is it that moves your highness? Macbeth, of course, sees the ghost that eludes the others at the table. But Lady Macbeth's frantic response to the unfolding situation emphasizes the ceremonial nature of the event being disturbed. When Ross proclaims, gentlemen, rise, his highness is not well, for example, Lady Macbeth quickly urges those present to remain in place. Pray you keep seat. 
When things deteriorate further, however, Lady Macbeth tries to empty the room quickly, encouraging the guests to leave immediately. At once, good night, stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Now, I don't know about Kansas, I haven't spent enough time here, but if a bloody ghost shows up at a dinner table in Atlanta, we would likely be disrupted. <laughs> but, um, but her, Lady Macbeth's efforts to retain order emphasize that the, the chaos of this, this dinner party undermines the social conventions associated with banquets in the society, as well as the equilibrium of the occasion. None of the guests or Lady Macbeth can see the ghost, but they, on, they only know that the expected order of events has been disrupted in a tense and inexplicable manner. Macbeth, moreover, violated protocol in an earlier feast with King Duncan when he failed to appear at the appropriate time allocated for him as host. In each instance, Macbeth interferes with the customs associated with banquets, which include highly choreographed movements and elaborate seating charts, particularly when monarchs are present. Greer spends considerable time explaining the formal structures of such events, and he's doing this in part to offset common misperceptions about such events that have been created by films and television and Renaissance festivals. <laughs> so this is a quote. This chapter will consider a few prime examples of major feasts to illustrate something of their ceremonial character. It is important to appreciate that the modern perception of a feast as a display of drunken debauchery, repulsive manners, and lechery is the creation of ignorant directors. <laughs> the feast was certainly an enjoyable experience, but it also incorporated a high degree of formality and ceremony, which could only be successfully accomplished by nobles, gentry, and upper servants meticulously trained in all its complex refinements. It was also a feast for all the senses, each carefully orchestrated to achieve the richest displays of opulence and magnificence, equaling, perhaps even surpassing, those of the great services of the church. This is not Henry VIII tossing the turkey legs over his shoulder. He then provides meticulous historical details of the kinds of complex refinements alluded to above, which include elaborate processions organized for by rank for entering and leaving the festivities, something Lady Macbeth mentions briefly but significantly when she urges the abandonment of such procedures. She's just saying, go, don't go in order, just go. Once in the banqueting area, visitors obviously would expect food. Macbeth oh, doesn't talk about what the menu would have been served, but Lloyd describes the typical diet consumed by people in this rank at these per this period. They ate expensive luxuries that included high quality variants of staples, fresh tender po produce, and exclusive foodstuffs that were used sparingly some of these high-value foods included game and an ever-expanding range of exotic items such as foreign fruits and vegetables. The basic foods they ate, however, could still symbolize elevated social rank. This is because they were prepared and cooked in special ways. So what you ate and how you ate it said a lot about who you were. Lloyd further observes that during this period, quote, hierarchical structure was thought to promote and stabilize a society in which divisions in wealth, patterns of interaction, including duties and obligations, and relative levels of honor and integrity were essential characteristics of order. Correlations between status and food consumption figured prominently in such hierarchies. Not surprisingly, therefore, Shakespeare also frequently refers to consumables, such as sugar, that were largely restricted to those enjoying comfortable financial circumstances. As Lloyd notes, quote, these delicacies were multifunctional. They enhanced dishes by changing their flavor or texture. They were beneficial to health in England's relatively cool, moist climate. That's an understatement if you've ever been to London. <laughs> and they were reassuringly expensive for the well-to-do. 
Shakespeare references to sugar. Shakespeare references sugar in numerous plays, but there is a notable cluster of references in Henry IV, Part One, a drama that focuses largely on controversial relationships bridging typical socioeconomic divides. As Hal, the heir to the throne and future Henry V, frolics with people socially far beneath him, sugar frequently enters the conversation, as these examples indicate. Nay, but hark you, Francis, for the sugar. And what says Sir John Sack and sugar? While the text does not reveal how commonly sugar was served at the Boar's Head Tavern, they all frequent, this ingredient was expensive during this time and would predominantly appear in wealthier places. Breer's notes, for example, quote, at the opening of the 16th century, most of the sugar used in England was imported from the Middle East and the Mediterranean by the Venetians in a refined or semi-refined form. Sugar was also becoming a significant marker of expanding trade routes through this era, as Breer's remarks, and I quote, having been carried to the New World by Columbus, sugar began to be cultivated by the Spanish in the Caribbean, Mexico, Paraguay, and the Pacific coast of South America, while the Portuguese grew it in Brazil. He also suggests that sugar further entered England through shady means such as piracy, and I quote, in 1591, a Spanish spy was reporting that English booty in West India produce is so great that sugar is cheaper in London than it is in Lisbon or the Indies themselves. Shakespeare does not, however, comment on growing understandings about the dangers of sugar importation or consumption during this period. But Joan Thirsk notes that, that recording of, by Dr. James Hart, who wrote this next passage a, nearly a decade after Shakespeare died, and I think it's kind of surprising from that perspective. Hart was sharply aware of changing fashions in food and drink in, in his day, and as a Puritan, he was highly critical. His sharpest jibes were directed at women, who he thought responsible for most of the fads of the moment. They liked sweet things and had taken such a liking to sugar that honey was now despised. His medical experience surfaced here when he warned his readers that sugar rotted the teeth. More significantly, perhaps, he suspected that the high death rate in London, as shown in the bills of mortality, was due to merchants whitening sugar with leaves of lime. Shakespeare's characters either ignore or remain unaware of the problems with sugar. When sugar is mentioned in the plays, it connotes sweetness in the food and drinks, or uncomfortable foods and deeds that are made palatable by tasty coverings. Polonius says this in Hamlet, pious action do we sugar over. Greer's indicates, moreover, that sugar increased in popularity during Shakespeare's lifetime, which probably accounts for the way it's mentioned in the plays, and I quote, the Tudor taste for sugar intensified so that the trade rapidly expanded, and by 1585, London had replaced Antwerp as the leading refinery center in Europe. The wealthy were apparently not yet overly concerned with tooth decay or diabetes. However, at the same time that these banquets were happening and that sugar consumption was increasing, impeded access to food was a problem for many people during Shakespeare's lifetime, as his plays periodically know. The political upheavals and confrontations between those in charge and ordinary citizens in Coriolanus, for instance, partly result from the latter's inability to acquire enough grain to provide for their dietary needs, as the opening dialogue indicates, and I quote, care for us, true indeed, they ne'er cared for us yet, suffer us to famish, and their storehouses crammed with grain, make edicts for usury to support usurers, repeal daily any wholesome act established against the rich, and provide more piercing statutes daily to chain up and restrain the poor. If the wars eat us not up, they will, and there's all the love they bear us. Shakespeare's audiences would have been familiar with the innumerable problems associated with insufficient food, 
So the issues confronting the populace in Coriolanus's Rome would resonate for audiences in London. As John Bosted notes, English, quote, food markets were not simply functions of supply and demand, but were politically constructed, permeated by power and normative judgments, but were um, high and low and modified by social const contestations. In fact, according to Bosted, food riots first became the engine of a politics of provision in the late Tudor decades. The rapid early modern influx of people into London that helped create markets for Shakespeare's plays also triggered dramatic social changes during this period, where unprecedented mobility corresponded with a range of societal disruptions, including food shortages. As Breers and others have noted, the period 1500 to 1660 was one of unprecedented change. Shakespeare's London was particularly affected by these movements, largely because of its rapid growth. Um, the city expanded from a population in 1500, there were 50,000 people living in London. In 1700, there were 575,000 people living in London. As a consequence, London inevitably experienced considerable pressures on all of its resources. The disparities between the, that these reveal between the rich people and the starving people come to the center of Shakespearean drama in Time and of Athens, a play that Shakespeare may well have composed with Thomas Middleton. In the early scenes of the text, what the wealthy Timon is hosting lavish feasts where he offers extravagant gifts and loans to the people he perceives to be his friends. His feasts become significant social occasions, partly due to how luxurious they are, but also because he offers his guests lots of money. Good dinner party, good food, money to take home. As Fitzpatrick notes, however, um, as the play proceeds, conspicuous consumption in feasting gives way to food as a vehicle for punishment. At the beginning of the play, Timon displays all of the excess that I've been talking about, it, presenting the extravagant culture of feasting and banqueting among the wealthy that occurred during Shakespeare's time. As Fitzpatrick notes, Timon's numerous invitations to dinner indicate his hospitality, but also his profligacy. At the start of the drama, Timon's banquets fit the pattern we've been seeing. When his expensive hospitality and abundant gift giving lives what leads to bankruptcy, however, his, he soon realizes that his friends are actually bound to his hospitality rather than feeling any attachment or loyalty to him personally. He makes several requests for financial help when his overspending catches up with him, but nobody will, will provide him with any money. So he once again invites his usual guests to a banquet. The notes that set the scene suggest that the party corresponds with the ones held earlier. This is scene six, a banqueting hall in Timon's house. Music, tables set out, servants attending, enter divers lord, lords, friends of Timon at several doors. Although those arriving express concern by, um, about Timon's recent request for funds, they're calmed by, quote, the persuasion of his new feasting. They're also impressed when the banquet appears. The second lord says, all covered dishes. First lord says, royal cheer, I warrant you. The third lord says, doubt that not if money in the season can yield it. So this is going to be some party. <coughs> Notably, however, the guests are not privy to the aside time and offers in anticipation of the dishes arriving. And this is what he says. Gentlemen, our dinner will not recompense this long stay. Feast your ears with the music a while. If they will fare so harshly of the trumpet sound, we shall to it presently. Timon's guests in this instance fail to de realize what Lloyd deems the symbolic meaning of the food. As Loyal, Lloyd suggests, it is not just diet that marks identity, it was sociability or the lack of it that could establish, reinforce, or change relationships. 
In this case, Timon transforms the normally lavish and hospitable occasion of the banquet in order to demarcate significant changes in the relationship between himself, his host, and his eager guests. Initially, he leads them to anticipate a feast similar to those offered previously, although he also indicates that ordinary differentiations between the ranks will not be observed, so they won't be going in procession by, um, by rank, and this is from Timon. Each man to his fool with that spur as he would to the lip of his mistress. Your diet shall be in all places alike, so you're going to get the same food no matter where you sit. Make not a city feast of it, to let the meat cool ere we can agree on the first place. Sit, sit, the gods require our thanks. When it comes time to eat, however, Timon's affect changes, and he tells the gathering, quote, uncover dogs and lap. <laughs> the notes indicate that, quote, the dishes are uncovered and seem to be full of warm water. As Timon rages against his guests, quote, may you a better feast never behold, you not of mouth friends. Smoke and lukewarm water is your perfection. This is Timon's lass, who stuck and spangled with your flatteries, washes it off and sprinkles it in your faces. As one disgruntled guest responds, one day he gives us diamonds, next day stones. While Shakespeare is unlikely to be anticipating the decline of banqueting culture that emerged in the decades following his death, Timon may well be reflecting some of the negative reactions to these customs that emerged during this time period, particularly when lavish feasts took place in periods of widespread poverty and times of significant social change. Breers, for example, terms this era as the golden age of the feast, but he also notes that it was largely to disappear in the mid-17th century. At the height of banqueting culture, social stratification was seen as extremely important. Lloyd further suggests that hierarchical structure was thought to promote and stabilize a society in which divisions of wealth, patterns of interaction, duties and obligations, and relative levels of honor and integrity were essential characteristics of order. He notes, however, that by the early 17th century, social and economic changes began to be resolved by drastically reducing the number of polite serving men in most of the great households. He also frequents details changes in the formal structures providing, supporting banqueting culture. The free, open-handed hospitality so valued by previous generations had largely been withdrawn. With fewer numbers to feed, kitchens might now be made much smaller. Further, festive occasions at which luxury foods were presented not only helped shape and define relationships and exclude outsiders, like Kate, by denying them those foods, but were platforms for expressing cultural identity. Banqueting and feasting, however, could attract criticism, especially during times of great hardship. Hyman's denunciation of the practices he formally embraced may not correlate to increasing societal concerns about the customs he eventually rejects, but his shifting perspectives on the lifestyle he eventually eschews correspond with the kinds of concerns about these events that soon facilitated their cultural divide, demise. When Timon thwarts traditional expectations by serving warm water instead of luxury culinary items, he stops short of upsetting the feast as completely as Titus Andronicus does when he presents Tamara with her sons baked in a pie. Why, there they are, both baked in this pie, whereof their mother daintily hath fed, eating the flesh that she herself hath bred. Look closely at pies before you eat them. <laughs> Nevertheless, he brings the banqueting tradition under scrutiny during a period where it both flourished and exhibited signs of its imminent demise. Recreating realistic early modern banquets on stage could be challenging for acting companies during Shakespeare's time. The number of dishes served and the intricacy of the kind of contemporary pastry and sugary creations would overwhelm the resources of available to professional actors. Inverting the well-known customs associated with these practices, however, as the playwright ably undertakes in the plays that I've mentioned, relies more heavily on common understandings of the formalities associated with such occasions than on presenting these highly choreographed 
events accurately during performance. Audiences would understand the startling significance of the interrupted and disrupted feasts discussed here. As noted, these feasts were largely organized to demonstrate and sustain orderly, hierarchical societal structures. Representations of their inversions, therefore, would aptly illustrate both the willful and the accidental destruction of social order being presented in these plays. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Um, this last um, point that you were talking about the actors uh, and the scenes, are you suggesting that uh, these scenes actually had the foods that would be used? Uh, in these banquets? At, no, I'm actually saying the opposite, that they, the, the social occasions needed to be laid out and that the audience would have been able to supply right. in their imagination what they would have been because during this time, recreating it on stage would have been beyond the ability right. and it wouldn't have fit in with the way that plays were presented during this time. Whereas now, we, we focus so much on realism in many respects, um, but that wouldn't have been, but people would have had an understanding of what these occasions would have been like. So, yes? Um, I like that very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, these, these plays are all creations of words, and so it seems interesting to me that, uh, that they would even bother to create the food since they're creating the occasion. So I think it's so interesting that the meat split can come in and uh, that uh, food off it. I wonder about like actual settings and the, and the way that the food serves as a kind of marker of uh, obedience. And I think about Elizabeth going out in processions and being fettered at all those country houses. Uh, I don't know really much about James, but I assume it all went on. Uh, then the parliamentarians came in, I'm sure, washed it all. No, I think that I think that that's that's really quite interesting. I mean, again, during this time period, one of the things that people were concerned about were servantless men and people who weren't part of hierarchical structures. And so, mo you know, so many people would have been in service. So even if you were poor you would know from your job potentially what the different places you know what people were eating and all of that and i'm not sh and, and so food had the same way as as those of you who who know shakespeare know you know the sumptuary laws determined what people could wear what fabrics they could wear what colors they could wear many many aspects of people's lives were linked to their status and it's harder, I think, for us to find a similar thing. The one that, you know, there are obviously, as we know from the lack of grocery stores in poorer neighborhoods with fresh produce and all of that, there are all kinds of socioeconomic links between food and our own culture. But I'm not sure that we regularly think of it as often. I mean, the one time that I remember, um, and for some of you, you'll be too young for this, but I saw The Deer Hunter, the movie, for the first time in Dublin. And I was probably the only American in the audience because I was the only person who screamed when the person took the Twinkie and dunked it in the mustard. <laughs> now that was a food scene that an American audience would pick up on without question. But the Irish audience were like, what's her problem? <laughs> Yes. Well, I'm now thinking about um, access to grocery stores and um, and linking maybe to the first question about um, your argument about the sort of disruption of the feasts. And I'm also thinking about um, the king's men who are performing these things. And I think, and I can't remember 
it's one of the two uh, King's men, either John Hemmings or Henry Condell. I think it's John Hemmings who's a grocer. Mm -hmm. So that's part of his, uh, you know, his background. His, uh, he's been trained as a grocer. Um, and there's some suggestion, of course, that there was also food in the theater. So certainly somebody like him could have had access to get that actual food. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right that the, there may be like a need for the feast to be disrupted to because of the kind of material limitations of the, the show. You can't have that kind of food every single you know time you perform this particular play. It's just not practical. And I think Shakespeare's often thinking about those kind of theatrical practicalities, mm -hmm. right? But then there's also the fact that people in the theaters are eating, right? Like, so I yeah. think, you know, the archeological digs have shown hazelnuts, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I can't remember what else maybe you do. Oysters or I don't know, something yeah, lots, that boggles yeah. the mind. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just wondering, maybe there is a suggestion of a kind of a, you know, a, a here's what's on sale this week. <laughs> <laughs> potential for that um, in the theater to advertise maybe a little of that food stuff without sort of you know wasting a lot of food there so I, I mean but I, I like your argument and, and the ways in which I think you're leading us to see how maybe the play is written because of these practicalities the, the feast has to be disrupted mm -hmm. well I also think one of the, um, the things that we often forget um, and as you said, talking about the grocers is is how you know how direct you know people were ironmongers or grocers or polters or whatever, and those groups still are very important in London with a livery. And I'm a member of a livery company actually, which is really quite an extraordinary. But I'm not a fishmonger, <laughs> which I sort of regret. But I'm, I'm one of the worshipful company of educators. And what's interesting is that these livery companies have been in place since the Middle Ages. And they are still where an enormous amount of London's wealth resides. Like Goldsmiths Hall, for example, it, it is phenomenally wealthy. And so I think we've lost that direct connection to these trades in ways that I think still are visible in England, in ways that we don't, and particularly as so many of our factories close and things like that, that we've, we're just in a different environment. But I do think that they would have been very aware of where things came from, who was producing them, how were they being provided, um, and certainly when you know with the exploration and the new things coming in from America and the Caribbean and all of that, yeah. But no, I don't think it would have been on stage. <laughs> yes. So, as a medievalist, I deeply appreciated the argument that these banquets were very scripted and planned and not drunken frat parties <laughs> as they are often <laughs> depicted. Just like uh, Anglo-Saxon feasts particularly always look like drunken frat parties mm -hmm. in pop culture. And so I'm really interested to hear you talk a little bit about how the plans often included interruptions and I'm thinking about interludes and masks and things mm -hmm. like that where the arts are actually coming in and interrupting the eating mm -hmm. in really deliberate ways. Mm -hmm. No, and that certainly that certainly did happen and one of the things when we talk in modern terms about conspicuous consumption we got nothing on the Elizabethans. I mean, these banquets, if you look at the things that they were providing, you know, the, the elaborate pastry and sugar dishes and all of that, nobody was gonna eat all of those. That was not the point. The point was the display. And so you're right, there would be various interruptions and people would, you know, they'd have to digest certain things, but they weren't expected to finish it. It was just, okay, here, you're gonna admire that I have the most talented pastry chef ever who has made this, you know, this creation that looks exactly like whatever, you know. I mean, that's one of the things when I was, um, I was cooking, making fish in a coffin, so we had to make the coffin, 
then we had to make the fish, and then we had to make pastry fish scales so that we could recreate a fish on top of the fish that we were cooking. You know, and the swans and all that stuff. So again, they're, they're elaborate occasions that would go on for a very, very long time. Because this was their social life and this was their, this was how people were jockeying for power and all of that. And again, if you think about everything, you know, and, and there are actually, I've been to modern universities that have faculty line up according to what year they started at the university. There are still places that do that. But if you think about every occasion that you went to, it, it was going to matter. Like, where do you fall in the hierarchy? I mean, if your seating here was, no, you can't sit there, <laughs> you know, that's where you have to sit. That's a, a different world. So, yes? And, uh, so I really enjoyed your talk. And I'm so sort of interested and sort of thinking about the way that gender operates as well more, because a lot of what you're talking about is a disruption of kind of rank, right? Mm -hmm. and, but you also you start off with Kate in the Taming of the Shrew, and there's obviously something happening with gender as well, and if you think about um, Lady Macbeth, and I was thinking, what food do we have in Macbeth? And it's her milk, right? Mm -hmm. It's the thing that gets kind of cited, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then I'm a Victorianist, right? By the time you get to the 19th century, women have got a very kind of key role, right, in terms of, uh, in terms of an association of, of giving of food, right, which you also see sort of in the roots of the word lady, right, and both giver, and those, uh, those kind of etymological roots as well. And so I'm just wondering if you could talk more about the, the sort of the disruption of, of gender that you might see as well as the disruption of the kind of, of the order of brand. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, gender and food are important, and in terms of who prepared the food and who would clean up after the food, you know, who would serve the food, all of those sorts of things. Um, and there's been a fair bit of I, again. I think it gets back to your question. You know, that was a lot of the training, the education that women would get would be how can you oversee events like this learning how to organize and make sure that things were choreographed correctly, et cetera. And so the women would have a huge stake. If you remember from um, Romeo and Juliet, when Juliet's father sort of shocks everybody saying, I'll do the wedding feast. Nobody ever is going, how can he possibly do the wedding feast? And he initially goes, well, have a wedding tomorrow. It'll be fine. It's like, no, that's not how it's done. So there are, that, and that's one of the things that I think is, is important for us to keep in mind with Shakespeare is that there's lots of those little moments that it's just something gets said and then people go on to something else, but then there's a lot of socioeconomic and gendered resonances there that are easy to skip if you're not paying attention or if you're watching a production that cuts that line out. I mean, that's why even though I, I think most of us don't want to go to a five-hour performance of Hamlet, um, <laughs> I can understand why the, the, the textual scholars who get really upset by any cuts, there are consequences to cuts. And so, you know, some of those lines that you initially think, oh, they're not that important, can end up to really be significant if you know what exactly they're talking about and what they're, the worlds that they're opening up to us. So. Uh, more questions? Yes. That's you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if I have a very f well formulated question, but I'm kind of interested in some of the examples you talked about that go beyond your cool one of making fish scales out of dough and putting it on the fish, which requires labor, which is the you know, excessive amount of labor to create this rarity. But I guess I'm interested if there's a difference, well, I know there's a difference, but how, how much weight it carries between ridicu ridiculous, I mean, that's, that's sort of silly, but really terrible excess uh, that might be. And I'm thinking that the, the era was aware, of course, of satiricon and, and decadent, what it thought of, thought of as decadent presentations of food. I think there's a case of, of um, Charles II's wife got a birthday cake with 
Jeffrey Hudson, a little boy, was given to her as a slave, uh, a dwarf. Um, or in Johnson, uh, in Balcone, his his idea that oh wow we're going to you know we're going to get uh, animals and feed off of them that are that are rare like the phoenix. And I think there's a movie of contemporary movie of people that uh, have a secret society for eating, eating serving endangered species <laughs> as as part of the as part of the meal. So I guess I'm wondering if if you know where in what cases. Is it recognized or acknowledged that we're going so far above just social class? You know, it indicates more than you know this impossible level of whatever appetite or the record excess. Is well, I, and I think that that's what I was talking about a bit towards the end. That particularly as the population grew and all the crop failures and all of that, that the decadence became obscene. And I think there are moments when that happens and that that, and again, there were tangible consequences is that people weren't hiring as many people and they were having smaller banqueting facilities and, and all of that. But um, people were certainly aware of it, but Shakespeare, I don't think, is criticizing it at the same way that, you know, like when you're talking about Johnson or something like that, I think that's a different a different perspective, but I could be wrong. If you think of one, let me know. <laughs> well, eating your kids is usually hard. Well, yeah, eating, 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 eating people is wrong, things. I've heard, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, I actually, in London a couple of years ago, went to an event that was at a church that the, the claim was that Shakespeare had, visit, had attended this church. And afterwards, we were invited across the street to the pub, and the church was supplying one drink and a pie. And they were giving you a coupon that you could have a meat pie or a vegetarian pie. It's like, there's no question that I'm going to get the vegetarian pie. <laughs> and they actually had a quote from Titus on the, on the coupon. So I think they were trying to test whether people really knew their Shakespeare or not. <laughs> But, but no, the take-home message is eating people is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know our Shakespeare better now. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Sheila Kavanaugh.